please take your Bibles and turn to Jeremiah 6, verses 18 through 30, finishing up the chapter, what God really wants. Today we come across a theme, and it's actually going to be seen next week as well. Uh, so much so that I probably could have just preached all of Jeremiah 16 last week and uh, gotten into Jeremiah 17 next week, but uh, I, I felt like I was stretching it a bit here. Um, it's a theme that is pervasive in Scripture. There, there's so many places, and we're going to go to a lot of them this evening in our application time. Uh, the teaching time is actually not going to be that long, and the application time is going to take more of our time as we read a good portion of Scripture, understanding a theme, a theme which spans Old Testament and New Testament, forms the basis for tracing the concept of salvation by grace through faith, not only as it relates to Jesus' ministry, but as it relates to the Old Testament as well. And we'll find this concept as we continue to walk through God's message to the nation of Judah. Last week in our time together, God called for the nation to delight in the law of the Lord. If you recall, we walked, it was actually quite a long application last week, walking through several scriptures, encouraging us to delight in the law of the Lord, recognizing that the blessing that is upon God's people is not upon a, a people who, who uh, simply know some things about God's word, but who truly delight in the law of the Lord, to seek peace and joy through submission rather than rebellion, to find freedom not in license but in obedience, to see that the power of God is rooted in obedience to the Word of God. And this is a concept, as we considered it last week, that is so foreign to our time and our age. In our age, rebellion is seen as freedom. Freedom is seen as rebellion. That when people think of the concept of freedom, it's I get to do what I want. And in fact, what we find in the Bible is that freedom as it's related to the Word of God, as it's related to God as He teaches freedom, is found in the capacity to understand and obey the Word of God. It's found in submission. This is where the joys of freedom are found. And this week we're going to finish the chapter, then study this theme which spans the Word of God. And if we are wise, if we seek and love peace, as the Scriptures mentioned last week, then we will love this and we will obey this theme as we see it pervasively. Now, we're starting in verse 18 this evening, but actually for context, I'm going to begin reading in verse 16. Verses 16 through 18 is what we'll read as we begin this evening. And the Bible tells us this, Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls." But they said, We will not walk therein. Also I set a watchman over you, saying, Hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, We will not hearken. Verse 18, Therefore hear ye nations, and know, O congregation, what is among them. So we go back in context just a little bit to remind ourselves uh, about what God is saying, to set an understanding for what God is saying. He's calling the people to ask for the old paths, to ask for the way wherein is rest for their souls. And we de connected this last week to delighting in the law of the Lord. In the old path, that path that God had established on Sinai, that path that God had established in that first generation, in that path was and is truth. And in truth is rest. We then pick up in verse 18. Therefore, God says here, here, he says to the nations, and no, O congregation, so he says to the nations here, he says to the congregation, to those that meet, hear and know what is among them. Them who? Well, them the nations. Them the congregation. God says the congregation needs to understand and know what is among them. And what is among them, as we've read it over these past several weeks, is judgment. What God is saying is you need to know what's coming. I've said delight in the old paths and you said we will not walk in them. I've raised up someone to speak. I've raised up someone to, to sound the trumpet and you said we won't listen. Well then you need to know, O oh nations, as I testify of what's going to happen to Judah, you need to know congregation, Judah, what is among you and what's among you 
is judgment because they've rejected the way of truth. Verse 19, God says, Hear, O earth. So he, he begins by saying the nations. Then he says to the congregation, so he starts big, goes small, and he brings it back big again. Hear, O earth. Behold, I will bring evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not hearkened unto my words, nor to my law, but rejected it. So he calls the judgment that he is going to bring upon them the fruit of their own thoughts. This is the fruit of their rejection. We need to remember this. We've seen it several times in the book of Jeremiah already, and we'll see it again. And we need to see this theme that's going throughout, that God is not just being an unkind, unfeeling God. God is giving them the fruit of their own actions, the fruit of their own thoughts, the fruit of their own intentions. They are only getting that which God told them they'd get if they do not repent. So God testifies to the earth, correlated in the last verse with nations, right? So we had nations and earth, and then congregation and this people. He says, I will bring evil upon this people. But notice again the perspective. What is God actually doing? He's giving them the natural consequences of their thoughts, the natural consequences of their rebellion and rejection of God's word. We need to regard the proper, the proper relationship between choices and consequences, and this is important. The nation has invited judgment by their disregard for the word of God. God is not arbitrarily bringing judgment. This is not God being unjust or unfair or unmerciful or unforgiving or unfeeling. This is God bringing about the natural consequences of their actions. And this leads us to the principle, which we'll teach now, then we'll dwell upon in our application in verse 20. God says this, To what purpose cometh there to me incense from Sheba and the sweet cane from a far country? Your burnt offerings are not acceptable, nor your sacrifices sweet unto me. God says, what good is all this special treatment? What good is this incense that comes all the way from Sheba? I wonder if they had kind of a deal with the Queen of Sheba. We know that she came and visited Solomon in his days, right? And she left quite impressed, believing, as the text would, would seem to imply. And maybe it is that from that point on, uh, she was a blessing to the nation. He says, but what good is this incense from Sheba, this, this pure and wonderful incense? What good is sweet cane from a far country? What good are offerings of special sacrifices unto the Lord if you aren't going to obey me? So God tells them, your burnt offerings are simply not acceptable to me. Your sacrifices are not sweet unto me. What good are your, your prostrations? What good are your shows of religious zeal if you leave the elements of religious zeal and disobey me? I think of it this way. What good is my child looking at me and nodding, uh-huh, uh-huh, as I instruct him, and then at the end saying, yes, sir, and walking away if they just go and do the exact thing I told them not to do? What good are, are my children coming up to me and telling me all the things I expect of them if they go and they disobey anyway, right? It is not helpful to have you nodding your head and saying, uh-huh, uh-huh, I get it, to me if you're not going to listen to me. It's not helpful to do the outward displays of obedience if you're not going to actually obey me in heart. So God says, I have no pleasure. Your burnt offerings are not acceptable to me. Now, now remember this. Who is it that commanded the burnt offerings to be done? God. In his law, right? This was a ceremony, these are ceremonial, ceremonial commands. These are things that God said you need to do them. These are things that they needed to do regularly and on the Day of Atonement. This is important to God, but he says they're not acceptable to me. Your sacrifices are not sweet unto me. And this is such an important point. This is such an important principle. That's why we're going to dwell on it. Legal compliance, apart from spiritual obedience, is worthless and empty to God. God cannot be pacified, manipulated, or otherwise lulled into complacency simply by outward acts of compliance. I can't just put on a suit on a Sunday morning and walk into a church and sing the hymns 
and walk away and live like the devil for the rest of the week and think that that's okay because I put on the suit and sat in the, in the, the chair on Sunday. It does not work that way. God will not be manipulated. We're, we're, we live in a region that's it's got the big Christmas Easter crowd, right? Through the Lutheran Catholic liturgical denominations. They go on Christmas. They go on Easter. They give their money. They put their money in the plate. And then they don't think about God for the rest of the year. What good is that to God? What good is it for you to go to church on Christmas and Easter and, and, and then not think about God again for the rest of the year as if somehow by going to church on Christmas and Easter you're manipulating God into thinking that you're, you're actually serving Him or you're pacifying God's wrath uh, against sin because you're, you're showing up on Christmas or you're showing up on Easter. Right? This doesn't work. And that's the idea. This is the principle. We can't just give outward signs of some sort of religious devotion to God and think that God doesn't see our heart or God doesn't know what's actually happening within us and think that we're actually manipulating God by doing these things. God cannot be manipulated. We can't fool Him. My children can fool me. They do it quite often. My wife could fool me. My congregation can fool me. People can fool me into thinking they're something that they're not. You can, you, maybe there's someone in here that's fooling me and you know how to walk the walk and you know how to talk the talk and you sound good and you look good and you come in on your Sundays and you're all primped up and dressed and, 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 and you put on the lingo and you put on the verbiage and you say what needs to be said and you, 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 you do the blessed gods and you do the amens and then you walk away from here and you don't think about God again until next Sunday. And maybe that's the case. But if that is the case, this one thing the Bible teaches us in principle, God's not pleased. God's not pleased. It doesn't please God for us to attend upon religious observance if there is not behind it love and obedience. God says, your sacrifices, all of that religious observance, it's not acceptable to me. Your, sweet, your, your sacrifices are not sweet unto me. Not in and of themselves, only as an extension of the love of God's people toward him. And where there is no love, these sacrifices are not sweet. We continue in verse 21. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will lay stumbling blocks before the people, and the fathers and the sons together shall fall upon them. The neighbor and his friend shall perish. Now this verse is very important. God has been speaking of judgment at the hand of a violent army. And this is still on the schedule, as we'll see in verse 22 and following. But verse 21, God says that he will put stumbling blocks before the nation, before the fathers and before the sons, that they would fall upon these stumbling blocks. The idea here is that the nation's rejection of truth, the nation's attempt to manipulate God, to pacify God's anger simply through external religious observances, Will, their, their rejection of truth will impose upon them a comfort with darkness, a judgment of darkness. And we considered this last week. If God's word is the lamp unto our feet and the light unto our path, then to whatever degree we reject God's word, we are rejecting the light. To that degree, we should fully expect that we will walk in darkness. I'm not talking about whether you're a believer or an unbeliever. I'm talking about whether you regard or disregard the word of God. To whatever degree you disregard the Word of God, to that degree, Christian, expect that you will lack discernment. Expect that the things of this life will trip you up. Expect that there will be stumbling blocks in front of you and you won't see them and you'll fall on them because you don't understand God's Word. We see this happen with, with uh, uh, I, I've seen this happen on many an occasion with a young person. And they grow up in a Christian family and they know how to walk the walk and they know how to talk the talk, but they've never actually believed what God's word says. And so some young man or some young lady, particularly as it relates to relationships, oftentimes they get it in their head that this particular person is someone that they love and their parents say no and their church says, says don't do it. And they do it anyway because they say this is this is love. This is this is uh, th this is truth. This is what I feel. And they stumble at the stumbling block of of their emotions and they end up in a place that's much worse. That, that, that's a terrible place. And they end up there because they've stumbled at a stumbling block that they didn't see because at some point they stopped their ears to some element of the Word of God. 
And they started trusting what they feel or what they think instead of what the Word of God says. And this is what God says. God says, because you've rejected the Word of God, because you have these sacrifices, but they are not acceptable to me because they're done in, uh, in falsehood, they, they, they belie the Lord, right? I'm going to place stumbling blocks before you and you're going to trip over them. And you're going to fall over them and you're not even going to see that you're doing it because you have rejected the Word of the Lord. When we yield some measure of wisdom that comes from believing by faith the light found in God's word, we find, in the end, stumbling blocks. So God continues in verses 22 and 23. He says, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, a people cometh from the north country, and a great nation shall be raised from the sides of the earth. They shall lay hold on bow and spear. They are cruel and have no mercy. Their voice roareth like the sea, and they ride upon horses set in array against men for war against thee. O daughter of Zion. So once again, we see this promise of the enemy that comes from the north, an enemy that raised from the sides of the earth, meaning from a faraway land. This is Babylon, right? And God says they're going to come and they're going to come prepared for war and they're going to come to destroy and they're going to roar and they're going to have their chariots and they're going to have their horsemen and they're going to destroy you. And this is case in point about what God has been saying. Now think about just what has been said in this and so many other passages in the first six chapters of Jeremiah. They're being told of the brutality of the nation that will destroy them. They're being told of the surety of this judgment that is to come, but they don't see it. They don't regard it. Their eyes have been blinded. Why? Because they've not believed the word of God. Because they've thought that they can manipulate God into some manner of passivity through their religious compliance and it just doesn't work that way verses 24 and 25 we have heard the fame thereof our hands wax feeble anguish hath taken hold of us and pain as of a woman in travail go not forth to the field nor walk by the way for the sword of the enemy and fears on every side. Jeremiah describes the natural response of those who actually hear what God is warning of the fame and renown of this nation. He says that if, if they were listening when Jeremiah says the, the fame and renown, the, the terrible strength and the might of this nation, their hands would wax feeble. They would lose strength. Anguish would take hold of them. Pain as in a woman in travail. That would be a woman in labor. Jeremiah warns he says, don't go into the fields. Don't walk in the way. Because no matter where you go, the enemy is going to be there. No matter what you seek to, the enemy will be around the corner. And if they're not there, then the threat of them being there will be imminent. Fear of the enemy is there. Verse 26, O daughter of my people, gird thee with sackcloth, wallow thyself in ashes, make thee mourning, that would be like the sorrow mourning, M-O-U-R, as for an only son, most bitter lamentation, for the spoiler shall suddenly come upon us. Jeremiah calls to the people. He says, look, people, mourn. Learn to mourn. He pleads with them to to assume a posture of repentance, he calls for them to clothe themselves with sackcloth, to wallow in ashes. Sackcloth is effectively exactly what it's said to be. It's like a cloth made out of a sack. It's very simplistic as a garment. It's the most basic of coverings. It's intended to represent the fact that the man wearing it has absolute disregard for his personal appearance in deference to deeper and most sincere desires that the Lord would be with him, that he would repent before the Lord. It's very similar to the concept of fasting in that when you're fasting, you are, you are, uh, are symbolically telling the Lord, Lord, there are more important things than just food. There are more important things than just the needs of the body. That man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And I need you, God, and we need you. So we are going to withhold from ourselves those things that our body says we need in order to show you just how much we regard you as our need. And sackcloth is kind of a similar concept. The idea of sackcloth being that I am going, I'm not going to dress 
uh, nicely and I'm not going to spend the time to make myself presentable. I am just going to put on a sack to cover myself, to make myself decent as I devote myself to repentance. Sackcloth and ashes were both symbol symbolism of great mourning. Mourning that would be a natural extension of a heart that had found repentance. And so this naturally is the call. This is what Jeremiah is calling them unto. That they would show forth the outward manifestations of a heart of mourning and lamentation. In the same way that to this point, their actions had shown only rebellion and selfishness. They're called to repent because the spoiler is upon them. Now the message of the Lord now turns from speaking to the nation to speaking directly to Jeremiah. And we'll see this again next week in Jeremiah chapter 7 as well as God speaks to Jeremiah. God says to him, I have set thee for a tower and a fortress among my people that thou mayest know and try their way. They are all grievous revolters, walking with slanders. They are brass and iron. They are all corruptors. So God reminds Jeremiah of what he's doing there. God says, I've made you a tower and a fortress. A tower, which would be a place to warn, and a fortress actually being a place to defend. That God has given Jeremiah the right to warn them and to judge their way. And this message had been told from, to Jeremiah from the outset. We saw it all the way back in Jeremiah chapter 1. That God had commissioned him to be what I'll describe as an uncomfortable truth teller. That was Jeremiah's commission. Go and say things that people don't want to hear. God had made him a man whose charge it was to say those things that the people simply didn't want to regard. God promised that he, Jeremiah, would be a tower, a fortress, that they might attack Jeremiah, but that it would be a futile attack, that God would protect him. Perhaps God's reiteration here is to keep Jeremiah determined, knowing the frustration that Jeremiah must have already been feeling at this point under the difficult ministry that God had called him unto. And maybe Jeremiah was starting to feel discouraged, and God reminds Jeremiah, this is the call that I gave you. You are that tower. You are that fortress among the people. And God also reminds Jeremiah of something that's very important. When you are in ministry and you have people that don't want to listen and they are rebuffing you and you are telling the truth and they are rejecting the truth. One of the things that regularly happens in these circumstances is that they find a way to make you the bad guy, right? Even though you're calling them unto truth and you desire for them to do what is right and you're simply telling them what the Bible has to say, all of a sudden you're the bad guy. You are somehow the evil one. You're the one that, that is being legalistic. You're the one that's being judgmental. You're the one that's being fill in the blank, right? You're, 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 you're almost cult-like in your devotion to, to the Word of God, whatever it might be. And God reminds Jeremiah here, they're the revolters. They're the grievous revolters. They are the ones walking with slanders. They're slandering you. They're revolting against me. They are the problem here. They are brass. They are iron. The idea is that they have hard hearts. They are the ones that are refusing to hear. You're, you're, you're pouring water, the water of God's word upon them, and it's just falling off of them. You are, you, you are hitting them with it, and, and it's just bouncing off of them because they're hard-hearted. They're the problem here, Jeremiah. Don't give in to this idea that you're the problem. Don't give in to this idea that you're, you're being mean or you're being cruel or you're being judgmental. This is the ministry that I have called you unto. So our text finishes for today in verses 29 and 30. God says, The bellows are burned. The lead is consumed of the fire. The founder melteth in vain. For the wicked are not plucked away. Reprobate silver shall men call them, because the Lord hath rejected them. So he's going to continue on this idea of them being brass or them being iron. 
Uh, all right, so, so they're conti he's continuing with this metal theme. He says, the bellows are burned, the lead is consumed of the fire. So the bellows would be a raging fire. If you've ever seen an old-fashioned smelting process, uh, nowadays people turn on a propane tank and you know, they, they, they put the, the smelter on that. But if you've ever seen an old-fashioned smelting process, in order to melt down metal, you had to get a really hot fire. Like, uh, it had to be a bellowing fire going on underneath this, this, uh, uh, this stone in order to melt this metal. So, so God says the bellows are burning so much so that the lead is consumed in the fire, right? The impurities are burning away. That's how hot this fire is. It is at smelting temperature. It is ready to go. God is melting them. He says, but I'm melting them in vain. I am pouring my fire, the fire of my judgment, the fire of my words through Jeremiah on them in vain. The, 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 the dross is not melting away. They're reprobate silver. This silver will not be cleansed. So the process of smelting, you put the metal into the, 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 smelting, uh, into, into the, the basin for the smelting process. And as the metal melts, the impurities will separate from the metal itself and then you remove those impurities. And God says, I am pouring the bellows of my fire upon them, but they're not melting. They're not melting. They are maintaining a hardness. They, they are reprobate silver. It cannot be purified. It refuses to be purified. It cannot be refined. And if it can't be refined, then it's going to be rejected. If the silver is, is beyond the state of being able to be purified, then it's no good to me, God says, and I'm going to have to reject it. And that's what he says here. That's his warning. Well, there's much to apply. I told you that application would fulfill the majority of our, of our focus together. And that we're going to consider a principle that is pervasive throughout Scripture. The title of the sermon was What God Really Wants. And our first point this evening is simply this. What God really wants is your faithful and obedient love. This is what God really wants. Now we'll talk about religion in our second point. We'll talk about the fact that religion is not a bad thing. I'm glad you're here this evening. I'm glad you're sitting in the seats. I'm glad you've taken the time to come. I'm glad that many of you have, have felt the desire to worship the Lord by coming, to worship the Lord in song, to worship the Lord in giving, to worship the Lord. I, I, I hope that you spend time in the week reading your Bible and praying. I, I, I'm, I'm glad if you do those things. These are good things. These are, these are important things. But all of these things are a means unto an end. And what God really wants from you, Christian, is your faithful and obedient love. This is the primary, one of the primary messages of all the prophets. It's the primary communication of, uh, that God sought to instill in the minds of those that he sought a relationship with. And it's needed today more than ever. We all have decisions to make about why we do the things that we do. And we all do what we do based upon a certain set of motivations. All throughout Jeremiah, God has been asking for one thing and one thing only. He has been asking for our love. But it's not just in Jeremiah. I told you we're going to walk through the principle. Let's walk through it together. I start with you in Jeremiah chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. The Bible says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. I was listening to a, a non-Orthodox but very conservative Jewish man the other day on the radio. It was not long ago. And he was talking about his great love for the Torah. The Torah would be the first five books of the Old Testament in, in our Bibles. And he was talking about the tremendous blessings that have come to his life because of his love for the Torah. And indeed, his love for the Torah had made him wise and insightful. And he was particularly saying about how much of a blessing uh, the, the fifth commandment had been to him, to honor 
thy father and mother. And that he had taken this commandment to heart and that he had honored his father and his mother and that this was very, very important to him. And he was just expounding upon his tremendous and deep love for the first five books of the Old Testament. But then he said something very interesting and somewhat uh, 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 telling to me. He said this, and I quote, he said, my vehicle to God is reason. I don't have a great emotional bond to God. I wish I did. I don't. My vehicle to faith is reason. My vehicle to religious life is reason. I'm not in love with God. I admit it. I have written an essay that the hardest law in the Torah is to love God with all your heart. But with all the suffering in the world, I admit I find it hard. I hope I'll achieve it one day. But I do love the Torah. Interesting. Here's a man that has found a love for the Torah, but he cannot find in his heart a love for God. And here's what we know. The day that he finds love in his heart for God, he'll, he'll find love in his heart for Christ, right? But he's not a Christian man. He's a Jewish man. And so he's a man that has been endowed with the wisdom of the Torah because he loves it. But he has not found a love for God. And he openly and freely admits that the one commandment that he really struggles with is the commandment to love the Lord thy God. Well, here's the problem. What's the first and greatest commandment? Jesus answered and asked of others, and they answered as well, to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy might. That, that is the essence of, of the Old Testament, right? Right? That is the essence of what it means to serve God. The essence of serving God is loving God. If you don't love God, then you are not obedient to God. Then you are not in the right place with God. It's not enough to love God's church. This is not just a problem among the Jews. This is a problem among Christians, Catholics. The Catholics, they love the church. Many, m many of them love the church. Many more of them love the church than love God. A Muslim loves the Quran, but if you ask them if they love Allah, much less the God of the Bible, they don't even love Allah. They, they, they fear Allah. They do not love Allah. They fear Allah. And as we bring this concept closer to home, let me just say this. We can be this way too. You can truly learn to love the manner of living that we live. You can learn to love conservative values. You can learn to love religious devotion. You can learn to love that time where uh, you, you come to church and, and you, you be among your, your, your fellow Christians. You can learn to love the essence of, of what it means to be in church and, and all of the religious devotion involved. You can learn to love dressing up on a Sunday morning and putting on the dress or putting on the suit and, and, and being creative and, and, and all of those things. You can learn to love those things while lacking a fundamental love for God. They are not the same thing. Loving the church is not implicitly loving God. Loving standards or expectations that conform to biblical morality is not implicitly loving God. Loving the security and the structure that comes from our manner of living is not implicitly loving God. We can love those things without actually having in our heart a love for God. And this is just me speaking of those that are happily religious. Then there's many in our circles who are quite unhappily religious. They do these things because they think that if they don't, then there's going to be some consequence. That God is going to strike them dead. Or that all of a sudden their life is going to collapse. Or that, that life as they know it is going to falter and fail. Or they're going to discipline, or disappoint their parents. Or they're going to disappoint their church. Or they're going to disappoint their pastor. And so they live in constant fear and this tension, this struggle, where on one side they say, oh, I've got to do right. And on the other side they say, but I don't want to do right. And they live in this tension. 
and life is miserable for them because they live under this tension and some of them just yield it, release it, say, fine, I'm just going to quit trying to impress my parents. I'm going to quit trying to impress my church. I'm done with this. And they just leave it. They leave it all behind. And then others live under this pressure for the rest of their life, constantly trying to impress or, or deal with the pressures of their parents or tradition or church or family. And, and there are these as well, thinking that somehow by staying under this pressure, they're also somehow pleasing God. And among all these people in each of these scenarios where there is no love for God, each person is missing the point. God doesn't, at its fundamental core, God doesn't want your religious devotion unless that religious devotion is an outworking of the extent to which you love Him. Because that's what God really wants. God wants your heart. My children can, I, I, I can, I can get their compliance, I can get their obedience, I can get the yes sirs, I can get the hop to it right awayness of the things that I tell them to do, but you know what? None of that is my object. That's not what I really want. I don't really want my child, when I say go do this for them, just to say yes sir and to go do it. I want them to love me enough to say I'm going to do this because I love my father, because I love my mother, because I trust my father, because I trust my mother. My children and I had a conversation about that this week, telling them what I want from them is their trust, that when I tell them something, that they can do something, can't do something, uh, may do something, may not do something, should do something, should not do something, to go do something, to not do something, we're having this for dinner, we're not having that for dinner, that they trust me enough to say, mom and dad love me, and this is okay with me because I know that I, I have the their love, and, 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 and they have my love. So, I, so that's why I'm going to obey. So that's why I'm not going to complain. So that's why I'm going to be content, because I love my parents, because I trust my parents. That's what God wants. God wants you. He doesn't want your stuff. He doesn't need your money. He wants you. He wants your heart. He wants your love. And he's given you every reason to love him. And the solution, by the way, is not to force yourself to love God because, by the way, you can't force love. Love is a choice. You can't manipulate yourself into loving God. It doesn't work that way. Love is organic. Love has to be something that, that is chosen. And we'll find out how to do that as we continue through our message. Well, let's continue walking through this principle. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. And Samuel said... Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. This is God's message to Saul when Saul forced himself to disobey the Lord in order to do the sacrifice before battle. And Samuel comes up and says, what have you done? And Saul says, well, you weren't here and the battle might happen. So I forced myself to, 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 to do the sacrifice even though I cannot do it. I shouldn't do it. This is disobedience. Samuel says, look, do you think God's going to bless you for disobeying him more than bless you for, for, <laughs> for, for protect you for having not done the sacrifice, but having done what God asked of you? God wants your obedience more than he wants your sacrifice. God wants your heart more than he wants your religious observance. God wants you to listen to him. God wants you to obey him. This is what God wants of you. Psalm 40, verse 6. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. Psalm 51, verse 16 and 17. The great confession of David after his sin with Bathsheba. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Do you see the theme running throughout the scriptures? What about Proverbs 21, verse 3? To do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. What about Isaiah 1, verse 11? To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. Wait a minute, God. You're the one that told us to do this. What do you mean you don't delight in it? Because your heart is far from him. 
God doesn't want the sacrifices of your body if you have not first given to him the sacrifice of your heart. God doesn't want the sacrifice of your wallet if it is not first the sacrifice of your heart. God does, he doesn't want it. God doesn't want the sacrifice of your prayers if it is not an extension of the sacrifice of your heart. Isaiah 29, 13. Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. God certainly rebuking it there in Isaiah 29, 13. Isaiah 66, verses 2 and 3. For all those things that mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. He that killeth an ox is as if he slew a man. He that sacrifices a lamb as if he cut off a dog's neck. He that offereth an oblation as if he offered swine's blood. He that burneth incense as if he blessed an idol. Yea, they have chosen their own way, and their soul delighteth in their abominations. God says, here's a people that are delighting in their evil while offering me incense, and that incense is just as much, that incense is to me the offering to an idol. Here's a people who have delighted in their sin while sacrificing unto me oblations. He says, that oblation that you're sacrificing to me is basically as if you're sacrificing to me swine's blood, which was unclean, right? A pig is unclean, which means it is an abomination to the Lord. These things, God says, are an abomination to me if they're not done out of a heart that delights. If you have no intent of loving me, of serving me, of actually obeying me, if you are just going to come and do your religious practice and then go home and pursue your wickedness, then I have no delight in your religious practice. If you're going to wake up in the morning and you're going to liturgically read your Bible or liturgically read your devotional book and then say, okay, now I can be done with God for the day and go off and live for yourself. God has no pleasure in you. And God has no pleasure in that. We, we're he, right here in Jeremiah chapter 6 this week. Next week we'll be in Jeremiah 7. In Jeremiah 7, 22 and 23, God says this, For I spake not unto your fathers, nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices. But this thing I commanded them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and ye shall be my people. And walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well with you. That's what God wants. God wants your heart. Ezekiel 33, 31. And they come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear the, thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. There's no pleasure in that with God. Hosea chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. O Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? O Judah, what shall I do unto thee? For your goodness is as the morning cloud, and as the early dew it goeth away. Therefore have I hewed them by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and thy judgments are as a light that goeth forth. For I desired mercy and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. God says they're like the morning dew. You walk outside when I, when I take my dog out in the morning, uh, and if I, if I go out in, uh, I, I certainly can't go out in socks. If I go out in bare feet, uh, th those bare feet are soaked. If I go out in socks, those socks are soaked because there's a, a dew on the grass in the morning, right? And I walk out there and there's this thick and heavy dew from the night below, but before because we hit dew point and there's this dew on the grass and yet give it an hour after sunrise, grass is dry. God says, Israel, that's what you are to me. You have this, this moisture, but it's not actually going to stick. It's not going to stay. It's going to melt with the daylight. As soon as anything comes up, that the moisture is gone. You're clouds without rain. You look like you've got something to give, but you don't actually drop anything. This is God's likening to Israel. This is, this is what God sees when he sees the person that is devoted to him in word, but not actually in heart. Amos chapter 5, verses 21 and 22. 
Look at, glean with me the language of this one. I hate, I despise your feast days. I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Though ye offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I, will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. The very things that God commanded him to do, God says, I hate it. I perhaps have likened this before or given you this illustration before. But a, 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 an important part of giving a gift to my wife is the fact that I thought of her, particularly as it relates to something like flowers, right? If I come home with flowers one day and I give them to my wife, now my wife is fine with flowers. She's not the biggest flower person. Uh, she'd much prefer if I come home with a, a thing of beef jerky than with flowers, right? But one way or another, it's flowers to her. So I come home with this thing of peppered beef jerky, right? And, 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 and she, she certainly loves the beef jerky or she loves the flowers, whatever the case may be. And, and I'll just stick with flowers so I can perhaps relate it a bit more. And she loves the flowers. The flowers are beautiful. She likes the flowers. She wants to put the flowers. She cuts the flowers. She puts the flowers on the table. She looks at the flowers. She smells the flowers. She's thankful for the flowers. But what is it really about me bringing home flowers that she, she truly delights in? It's the fact that I thought of her. It's the fact that I was out and about and I said, I want to get something for my wife and I went out of my way to get it and I spent money for it and I brought it home and I thought of something that she'd like, which is why beef jerky would work better than flowers because that means I know my wife, right? And I'm actually thinking of her, not just of woman, stereotypic woman flowers, but I'm thinking of my wife and plus, beef jerky is a lot more expensive than flowers. So, so th th there are these sacrifices that are made, right? Now, I automate the process. Okay? So now, I, uh, we'll, we'll stick with flowers because there's no, uh, there's no automated beef jerky service out there. But there's an automated flower service out there. And so I get on a flower service and I, I say, I want you to send a dozen roses to my wife every other week. Every, every other week, just send it, have it on the doorstep. And I say, okay, good, here we go. Now my wife is gonna get flowers, she'll know I love her, and I don't even have to think about her. This is great, right? I don't have to think about my wife anymore, and she can have these flowers, and, and then she's happy because she gets the flowers, and I'm happy because I get the points for giving her the flowers, but I don't even have to think about her anymore, which is good, because I don't wanna have to do that, right? And so now it starts, and two weeks go by, and my wife gets these flowers, and she says, oh, my husband was thinking of me, that's fantastic. And two weeks later, she gets the flowers, and then eventually, she says, hey, honey, thanks for the flowers. And I go, what? Huh? Oh, yeah, 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 of course, yeah. No problem. The flowers, right, because I've automated the process. And eventually she starts to realize I'm not thinking of her. I'm not thinking of her. The flowers no longer represent to her my thoughts toward her. The flowers represent to her my attempt to make her think I'm thinking of her. It might even begin to represent to her some layer of manipulation. And then when those flowers come to the doorstep every two weeks, if now she starts to view those flowers as manipulation, as a husband's way to get brownie points without having to actually think of his wife, then she's going to start to despise those flowers. She's going to see those flowers as her husband's attempt to manipulate her emotions rather than her husband's attempt to show his thoughtfulness toward her. So that thing that ought to be right and good and is right and good in its proper context becomes abhorrent to her because it represents something entirely different. This is the idea. This is the idea. Israel had automated the process of obedience, had found ways to legally justify their sin, had found ways to do what God had asked them to do without actually caring what God thought without actually showing any love to God. And it made the sacrifices not just ambivalent, not just, well, fine, whatever. It made them abhorrent to God. Because this is your attempt to manipulate me. This is your attempt to think that you can get away with this and not love me. But try to say you love me, though you don't love me. Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or of ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgressions, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He hath showed thee, O man, 
what is good and what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. What does God really want from you? He doesn't want ten thousands of rivers of oil. He doesn't want thousands of rams. He wants you to love him. Do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with thy God. Zechariah chapter 7, verses 4 through 10. I told you we'd be in a lot of passages. Then came the word of the Lord of hosts unto me, saying, Speak unto all the people of the land and to the priests, saying, When ye fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, even those seventy years, did ye at all fast unto me, even to me? And when ye did eat and when ye did drink, did ye not eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves? Should ye not hear the words uh, which the Lord hath cried by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited and in prosperity. So this is Zechariah appealing to Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. When they were in the 70 years of Babylon, uh, of Captarian Babylon, God says, did you ever once do a feast actually unto me in those 70 years? Remember what I said by the prophets back in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel? We just read it, right? Uh, when, uh, when Jerusalem was inhabited and in prosperity in the cities thereof round about her, when men inhabited the south of the plain, and the word of the Lord came unto Zechariah, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Execute true judgment, and show mercy and compassion every man to his brother, and oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor. Let none of you imagine evil against uh, his brother in your heart. I guess I stopped there. Uh, that, that's the, yeah, that's, that's the end of, of verse 10. You see the, the idea here. God says, none of those feast days for, were for me. They were for yourself. They were done in selfishness. You want to prove to me you love me? Do justice. Execute judgment. Care for the innocent. Show the fruit of your faith. Now to the New Testament. Matthew chapter 9, verses 11 through 13. When the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus said, Look, all of your outward shows of religiosity have done nothing to me, done nothing for me. I'm not here to take those self-righteous who think they're righteous I'm here to find sinners and call them unto repentance. Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn. And his disciples were hungered and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath day. But he said unto them, Have ye not read what David did when he was an hungered? And they that were with him, how he entered into the house of God, and did eat showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests? Or have ye not read in the law how that, the Sabbath, how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. But if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, ye would not have condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. Jesus says, here you are condemning me for plucking a few ears of corn on the Sabbath because we are hungry, but you have completely forsaken the fact that these priests on the Sabbath day profane my law, but they're blameless according to you. Jesus says, you're all mixed up. You've put the cart before the horse. You've taken that which is important and you've, uh, you've lowered it and you've taken that which is not important and you've elevated it. Matthew 23, verses 13 to 28. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entered, entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass the sea and land to make one proselyte, one follower, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more a child of hell than yourselves. Woe unto you, ye blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater the gold or the temple that sanctifieth the gold. And... 
Whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing. But whosoever sweareth by the gift that is upon the altar, he is guilty. Ye fools and blind. For whether is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift? Whoso therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it and by all things thereon. And whoso shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it and by him that dwelleth therein. And he that shall swear by heaven, sweareth by the throne of God and by him that sitteth thereon. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done and not to, have, and not to leave the others undone. Ye blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, clean first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones, and all and of all uncleanness. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. It's the same principle. Deuteronomy, 1 Samuel, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Hosea, Amos, Malachi, Micah, it's all the same principle. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 4 through 9. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, but a body thou hast prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings, and offering for sin thou wouldst not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. What does God really want from you? He wants your faithful and obedient love. We see tremendous precedent in this principle. It's one of the most pervasive principles in the entirety of the Word of God. Of course, that doesn't mean God doesn't want religious devotion. We'll talk about this in our second point. He did say in Matthew 23 that they should, should tithe the mint and anise and the cumin, right? These things ought you to have done, just not to have left the others undone, not at the expense of the weightier matters of the law. And this leads us then to another question naturally before we get to the second point. How do we love God? If loving God is what God wants, then how do we love Him? Love is a choice. It has to be a choice. It cannot be compelled. It must be grown. It must be decided. It's grown in us toward God the same way it's grown in anyone else. How do you learn to love anyone? You spend time with them, right? Care what they have to say. So we pray regularly. We read God's Word. We determine that what God says, I'm going to believe. And that last part is essential. That's where the choice part comes in. If God says that, I'm going to believe it. And you begin to learn and you begin to grow and you find out, you know what? God's word is the lamp unto my feet and the light unto my path. And it becomes clear and it becomes consistent and it becomes beautiful. And then you love it. And then you love him. Jesus tells us in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, we memorized it a few months ago. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him. And he with me. God does not sit on the throne in heaven laughing while men grope in the darkness to know him, trying their best to love God, but simply not finding the means by which to do so. This is not God, but God must be known and loved on his terms, not our terms. I cannot put God into my box of expectations and demands and think that this is what a relationship with God is. It's abhorrent to him. But if I will come to him, John 6, 37 tells us this, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and to him that cometh to me, and him that cometh to me, I will in no wise 
cast out. A love for God begins with a decision by faith that God is true and every man a liar. When we decide that God is true, we decide to follow that path. And when we reach Jesus, we accept his gospel. Jesus died on the cross to save us from our sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day in victory over sin and death and hell, that, that he has arisen to the Father, that he's coming back for his own. We are saved. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And we have now paved the foundation for our love for him, that he has redeemed us from all iniquity and purified unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works, as we learned in Titus 2 this morning. And then we get to know him and his spirit is teaching us and we dig deeper through prayer and we dig deeper through reading and we dig deeper through obedience. And when God asks us to step out in faith, we step out in faith and he shows himself faithful and we trust and we obey and the blessings are found and we grow in our love for him because he's God and he loves us and we love him because he first loved us. And the more you know him, the more you will love him. And then the obedience thing takes care of itself, right? Clean the inside of the cup, and then the outside will be fine. The obedience thing, it'll take care of itself if you love him. If you love God, you'll want to obey God. The obedience thing with my children, it'll take care of itself when they truly love me. Because then they'll want to obey me. John 14, 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. John 15, 10. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And again in 1 John. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. When we love God, his commandments will not be a problem. If his commandments are a problem, may I encourage you to do this? Don't focus in on the commandments. I'm not saying ignore the commandments, but I'm saying don't focus on them. Focus on a love for God. Focus on knowing him better. Focus on getting to know him better and watch as your love for God gives way to your desire to obey him. Now, we've covered a lot of ground, but I do want to highlight this last point. Remember this, that religion is a framework for pleasing God, not the essence of pleasing God. Sa if sacrifices don't please God, right? If 10,000s of rivers of oil aren't the essence of what God is looking for, then what good is religion, right? We can just throw it away. We can all become spiritual but not religious, right? Wrong. No. We've already briefly addressed this. We talked about it in a few moments ago in Matthew 23. But let me just remind you about how this works and why humans can get this so backward. Religion is intended by God to be the means by which we discipline our movable and inconstant hearts. Uh, uh, religion is a, a layer that, that is added to our lives because we're flighty, because we are prone to wander. Religion is a fence that we build made of God's commands and principles and set into standards in our lives which draw us toward God. The danger comes when we make religion an end unto itself. So religion is intended to be a fence that when I'm having a bad day, when I'm tired or I'm hungry or I'm grumpy for whatever reason and I am tempted to be angry and to sin instead of be angry and sin not or I'm tempted to not forgive a brother or I'm tempted to just go my own way I hit the wall of that religion and that bounces me back toward God and so I'm not feeling good in the morning and I get up and I'm oh, okay, fine, God. And, and I read my Bible because this is what I do in the morning. And as I read my Bible, God melts my heart and he sets my day because the word of God has drawn me to him. And as I get down on my knees in prayer, I am drawn to the Lord so that I'm grumpy and I'm, I'm grumpy at my children and I'm grumpy and it's making me grumpy at them and it's making me grumpy at my wife and it's making me grumpy at me. And by the way, this, is, this happened to me just Monday. 
So I'm talking about less than a week ago. And I'm grumpy, and I, I don't want to talk to my children. And all of a sudden, I'm thinking all these things, uh, uh, ways to be grumpy at my wife that she hasn't even done. And I am just grumpy. And then I say, well, it's pray t prayer time. And so I get down on my knees, and God says, as God inevitably does, don't you dare come to me with that heart. And so now I say, okay, God, what? I like being grumpy. I want to be grumpy. I deserve to be grumpy. And God says, you don't deserve to be grumpy. And if you want to come to me in prayer, you better get your heart right. So I get my heart right. I ask God's forgiveness. I pray. Then I go to my children and I ask for their forgiveness. Then I go to my wife and I ask for her forgiveness. And I get it right. And the religious devotion of my time in prayer drew me back to God. Drew me back. This is, this is the design of religion, that you come to church and maybe you're not feeling great and you're not happy or you're grumpy or whatever it might be or you had a bad time with your boss or you don't want to obey or you don't want to submit to your husband or you don't want to listen to your parents and you come and you get around God's people and you fellowship around God's word and even if that's not the point of the sermon, the Holy Spirit of God uses it in your life to draw you back to God. This is what religious devotion is about. This is why we do what we do. Why do I get, get in a suit on Sunday? It's not just to impress people. It's because it is an attempt by me to set a framework that says, my God is worthy of this. I don't come to judge others on how you're dressing or anything of the sort, but this is what my family has decided, and this is how, we, how, how we've decided to express a worth unto God. And so for every time where uh, these, th these uh, suits become cumbersome, there is a drawing back from time to time where I'm reminded I get to show some worth to God by the way I'm dressing. In the same way I would show worth to an employee by dressing up for an interview or show worth to the governor by dressing up if I'm going to meet him, I'm going to dress in a manner that reflects my heart of worth to God. And it just draws me back a little bit. And as long as that's the motivation, religion is doing its job. When all of a sudden religion becomes vain and empty, I'm going to please God by putting a suit on today. And if I don't put a suit on, then I'm not pleasing God. And I'm going to go to church and I'm going to show everyone how much I please God by wearing this suit. And I'm going to judge everyone's capacity to please God by whether or not they're in a suit. Now religion has become a stumbling block and there's no... There, there, there's no joy, there's no acceptable nature, there, there's no sweet, sweet smelling savor to the Lord. Right? Religion is a framework intended to draw me to God. When we automate religion, when we can do all these religious things without having to think about it, without engaging our hearts toward God, when we turn religion into the essence of our relationship with God itself, this is the place where religion falls short. Every person in this room can have the same religious activities and standards on any given day, and half of you can please God with it, and the other half doesn't, because one half is doing it because those religious actions are an extension of your love for God, intended to draw you nearer to God, and the other half of you will not please God because those religious actions have become a replacement for loving God, a means by which for you to be able to do things in the name of God without actually having to love God and obey God. It's a facade. And it's up to each of us in our own lives to know which one we are. And maybe there are times where you're one and you're the other another time. Or maybe there's a little bit of you that's one and a little bit of you that's the other. But let's remember this. What God truly wants is your faithful and obedient love. And my encouragement to you this evening is to search your hearts in this. Search your religious devotion. And search the things that you're refusing to do just because they're religious. If you have some things that you say, nope, that's religion, I'm not going to do it. Well, have you ever done a little bit of research to find out why that religious practice may have ever been there? Maybe there's a valid reason why it was there to begin with, and maybe there's something that can actually draw you to a closer relationship with the Lord in it. Or maybe there's things that you're doing and they're just an empty shell. You're doing them to be seen of men. You're doing them to feel good about yourself. You're doing them out of guilt. You're doing it out of pride. You're doing it to judge others. And it is empty. And, and your sacrifice unto the Lord is an abomination. How are we doing this evening? 
Do you, are you living out in your life what God really wants? This is what God pleaded with the people in Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 6. He says, this is what I want from you. I want your love. We'll see it again in chapter 7. God wants your heart, and to whatever degree you joyfully give him your heart, to that degree not only will you find a love for, for the word of God and obedience, but you'll find joy, and as we considered last week, rest for your souls. Thank you for listening to Pastor Jamin Wickler from Legacy Baptist Church in Buffalo, Minnesota. More information about Legacy Baptist Church and a library of sermons are available at www.legacybaptistchurch.net.